recycling needs for a sustainable community. All right. We're an interdisciplinary team and on the mechanical design, mechanical engineering side, we have myself, Michael Enriquez, Baba Carcisa, and Sergio Batodano, and our advising professor, Dr. Andres Tremonte. Uh, on the environmental side, we have Paola Davalos and Natalia Duque, and their advising professor, Baron Tansel. And we're a proud sponsor of the Global Civic Engagement Student Advisory Board. So our project addresses um, a lot of the most pressing issues that the world faces. So when people ask us, why didn't you focus on one specific thing? The reason is because there's not one solution to mankind's most pressing issues. There's a lot of problems that we have that are interrelated and connected. Poverty, the access to uh, unsafe drinking water, plastic pollution, and global warming. These are all linked things that we have to combine different disciplines and different solutions so we can address a, 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 a more sustainable approach for development. So in that effort, we have decided to combine the following um, areas, energy, water, sanitation, and recycling, in order to come up with an integrated solution. So um, these are a few of the objectives that we have set out to um, perform within our research. One of our objectives is to be, uh, implement a solar charging station outside of the FIU by the east side campus and with this solar charging station we're really going to acquire real-time data of um, the regions of South Florida and the tropical region as well. Another objective was to design a hybrid turbine experimental setup in order to analyze the power output from the turbine and also to assess the feasibility of the rain harvesting systems which is going to be integrated with water filtration and potential energy recovery. We also investigated some uh, biological treatment options for household wastewater, and we designed and tested an anaerobic digester to treat these organic wastes. And the final leg would be to design an innovative recycler, which would turn plastic waste into 3D printing material, as well as be able to analyze different thermal plastics such as HDPE and PET for these purposes of 3D printing. So we begin our. Um, journey with the solar energy unit. It is a mobile energy solar unit that we have uh, established on the east side of the campus. This is a, um, a social impact to uh, simulate students to uh, work on projects and show, uh, show um, their expertise and, and, and engage the community into the renewable energy aspect of, uh, of the engineering side. Here we have it housed in a um, locker box that is composed of a, a breaker box, a charge controller, an inverter, a MATE 3 that is used for data acquisition, and we have uh, two total deep cycle batteries, and usually the mobile energy units can be supplied to uh, rural, rural regions to uh, provide uh, mobile energy backup and other things like that. Uh, this is an electronic schematic of our mobile energy unit. Here we have two uh, panels rated at 210 watts, creating a 420 watt uh, PV array. Uh, these panels are um, arranged with some circuit breakers. Uh, the first one will be a 60 amp circuit breaker, which then will be um, routed to the charge controller. Now the charge controller is then going to take care of uh, providing the correct charge to the batteries. Uh, here the two 12 volt deep cycle um, marine batteries for uh, security for um, um, water. Um, now these are in series and combined give you a 24 volt uh, um, voltage with a uh, total of 105 amp hours. The main three, as I said before, is used for data acquisition. Uh, it gathers data by every 60 seconds we have it set up, so we're trying to get a, a, some good quality data. Uh, at the end of it, um, the voltage is being routed to the inverter, which is turning in the more or less uh, 40 volts that we're getting from the two panels and converting it into an off-screen current at 120 volts. That's going to be used for charging, uh, laptops, um, or anything else that, that can be used. Here is some of our real-time data. So far, we've had the unit, the main, um, the main three for two weeks, gathering a two-week summary of our energy. Uh, this is in watt hours. The blue represents the um, PV, and the red represents the charge controller um, wattage. We can see a spike around uh, 29th of March at around 1.2 kilowatt hours of energy, and the 6th of April was, was a big, a big spike. Uh, a lot of sunlight in that area. Uh, probably no overcast. Also, here we have a. Uh, a day, uh, what it is in a day basis. So um, we have some wattage over here starting at 8, 8 a.m. in the morning, and we have a peak around 1 o'clock, around 200 watt hours from the PV and the turbine. And the, the, the contrast here is uh, maybe some, we have more on the PV side than on the truck controller due to uh, some uh, 
losses from the electrical components. Um, on the top right, here is a technical model of community development model. And each cluster has 10 homes. Now we try to gather some simple, simple data uh, to what a fourth of family home might require in electrical needs, such as a TV, some small appliances, a fan, a small fridge, cell phone charging station, a supply cell, cell phone, and, <laughs> me. and uh, on that we gathered a complete um, kilowatt hour per day of energy required, which is 1.16 kilowatt hours per day. Our 420 watt PV array is uh, capable of providing around 1.2 kilowatt hours per day, and summing them up it, for the per month basis, we have around 31 kilowatt hours per month. And almost achieving uh, the total of 35.38, which is was what we calculated required for this fourth uh, person family home. Uh, it's about 87.7%. The remaining of the energy will be uh, supplemented by other sources which CISA will explain. One of the other energy that we considered was hydro energy. Hydro energy in this case was experimentally analyzed. We had a setup that was able to produce different cases, different elevations, because we need a lot of elevations in order to be able to have enough power output to rotate this pelton turbine. The pelton turbine that you see here is a model of SOLIDWORKS that the team designed, and it was then printed with the use of a 3D printer, and the PLA was used, as you can see, it was very close to the real, to the model that we, we, we designed. And uh, these are the different components of the hydro system. In order to achieve a realistic uh, analysis of a, of a river or a lake, you need to have components that are similar to the real life model. So we have here a frame that's housing all the components. Those components include a pipe layout that represents a pen stock that you will have in a regular river stream, and this pipe layout is going to convey the water to the first, the pressure gauge, which allows us to know the incoming water pressure. And the pressure gauge is going to give us the pressure from the pressure regulator. This pressure regulator is a device that allows you, that allows you to vary the incoming water pressure from 15 to 90 psi with an increment of 5 psi. So we want to have that pressure regulator at 45 psi, which is an elevation of 30 meters, and from there vary it. And we have then the pipe layout, which is connected to this nozzle that you see here. This nozzle is going to then produce the pressure that we need to rotate this water wheel turbine. The water wheel turbine is just enclosed in this acrylic tank, so we can waterproof it from this generator, so the generator that doesn't get wet. This generator is the blow model that we found that's rated at 12 volt DC and 2500 RPM. A model that's able to, that acts as a generator can be efficient as long as you rotate it hard enough, which is, in this case, we explained to go 2000 RPM at least in order to have enough power to, to, to go to the electronics part. The electronics part are really simple. We have a rocket switch that's just able to uh, isolate the system in case of emergency. And we have a rectifier because the, the water the voltage produced from the water will vary. So we want to have a steady voltage to go to the power inverter. And from the power inverter, we can then uh, power devices. Next slide. So in this slide, we just did a quick study analysis of the water component. The first analysis are the volumetric stress. We just applied a, a, a torque on the face here. And this torque was 9.8 pounds of force. This 9.8 pound of force was found from the rotation of the, of the disc and also the force that was the, for the water flow. And uh, we found a factor of safety of 90 from that analysis. These are the properties that we put into SOLIDWORKS in order to complete this analysis. This analysis involves the paddle. For this analysis, we assume that the paddle was glued on the disc and that the nozzle was uh, proposing a jet that was 0.25 inch on the sphere. So what happened was the, this for a factor of safety of 13.19 was achieved with properties of PLA. So both our parts passed our static analysis. 
Okay, now in order to assess the other needs of the community, um, our research includes uh, the harnessing of the harnessing of uh, the rainwater, is something that we have already available. Uh, this will consist of an interconnected uh, water network where each house will collect uh, the water per rain system and then it will be connected to a, uh, a more complete uh, water system. You will also uh, have a biosan filter, each of the houses. A biosan filter, well, we investigate this as a filtration option for the water to have clean access to drinking water. Uh, the biosan filter removes bacteria, viruses, and parasites by absorption mechanisms onto the sand, aided by biological activity that occurs in the top layer of the um, sand filter and is aided by a diffuser plate. Um, so basically what we researched is the virus removal rate as a function of the hydraulic loading and the mechanical properties of the sand that we have chosen. Um, and the idea of the interconnected water network is also to um, discover potential energy recovery that can be held whether it's elevating a tank of water or depending on the elevation that a, that a village could have, um, trying to harness as much energy from any type of source that we possibly can. Um, uh, in order for, uh, to treat the wastewaters of the household, um, we have one of the, our components will be a constructed wetlands. These are used to treat the gray water. The gray water of a household will be the water that comes from the faucets, from the showers, like all the water is considered uh, called gray water. Um, these wetlands, what they do is they mimic uh, the natural uh, properties of a wetland, which is uh, they remove uh, contaminants such as um, biological oxygen demand or suspended solids, nitrogen, phosphorus, and they do this uh, through sedimentation, absorption, um, microbial transformation, and the assimilation of the plant. So they take all this uh, component and they clean the water. The water is clean enough to use, uh, for example, as um, for irrigation systems um, or groundwater retention. Or groundwater retention. So another aspect that we that we focused on is the use of an anaerobic digester. This can treat um, the black water produced by a home, so all the sewage. The most interesting thing about the anaerobic digester is the capability of uh, digesting multiple substrates. So that means that any type of organic waste can be put into this digester and we recover very valuable products from it, which are biogas that can be used for heat and energy. Uh, it's a biogas that's rich in methane, about 65-70% in methane content. And we produce a, an exit of a biofertilizer. This slurry that comes out of it can be used for uh, crop irrigation or other applications such as uh, fish ponds or to for algae ponds. And the algae that is produced from the ponds can then be fed back into the digester for more biomass. So it creates like a closed energy cycle. So if you want more energy, you could go through that route. If you want, you know, crop, if you want fertilizer, you can go through that way. It has a lot of capabilities. On the top right corner, you see our uh, proposed digester design. There are various uh, models that we investigated from polyethylene tubing to um, floating drums, but this is the one that we ended up deciding to do a little bit more of a further analysis of how it functions. And here we can see a more detail, uh, this uh, the schematic of our proposed design. It will consist of a fixed dome digester. Uh, this is, uh, we chose this one because of economic reasons and also for material availability. Um, the design, the proposed design will consist of a community of 10 households. Uh, the, the, the digester will supply the, the gas needed for cooking for this uh, 10 household. Each household will consist of five to six people. Um, mostly of the biogas will come from the manure uh, for 8.5 and the rest 1.5 uh, cubic meters will come from the kitchen wastes and, and agriculture uh, waste as well. Uh, here you can see uh, the dome of the digester uh, will be used as a gas storage and here is the pipe where the gas will come out and this is the outlet where the slurry uh, will, come, will come out and there can be further used as a fertilizer. And here um, we built an, uh, a digester, uh, it is this, cons this consists of a two-phase digester. Uh, 
which we built to um, basically explore the co-digestion capabilities of a small, you know, kind of uh, micro-scale digester and also see how the two-phase digestion system works where the first phase of uh, transforms 80% of the waste into the biogas and then the next stage uh, uses the, the remaining 20% to, so we can get complete energy recovery from our substrates. And also the average carbon to nitrogen ratio of the feedstock into the digester, the, the recommended is 30 and from our calculations we obtained 29 so we're very close to the uh, target. See okay. Now this is the recycling portion of our system, and now uh, something interesting to consider is plastic. The interesting about plastic is that it's made to, to last forever, but it's used only a very few times, <coughs> and then it's discarded. So a solution to all this plastic waste is to create a, a what we call a recycler, which essentially is going to take different types of thermoplastics, which are mostly composed plastic uh, trash today and be able to turn it into usable green green feedstock. Now we, we made this uh, proposed design here, which is essentially a steel pipe, schedule 80, uh, and, a, and a tool steel auger, which would line, which would go inside. And the auger would be powered by this geared motor, and uh, will rotate at a low RPM, and the plastic bits, um, which would be, we would shred using this custom-made shredder, manually operated, um, would go into this section here, this hopper, and the auger would push it along here to this heated section where we have an aluminum sleeve which houses a cartridge heater as well as a thermocouple. Now, it eventually will, will be pushed out of a nozzle here of 1.80 uh, millimeters in diameter, which is a necessary diameter for 3D printing. Now, as soon as it is extruded, it's cooled here so that it maintains its diameter and wound onto this spool. So, this is the actual um, this is our actual design. It's much simpler than the proposed design, although it functions in the same manner. Uh, we have here the temperature controller, which we set to about, uh, we started at around 230 degrees Fahrenheit and eventually went up to 350. Uh, and at that point, 350, it started extruding. And uh, as, we, as we said, we have the steel pipe and the auger here connected to, these, uh, to the stepper motor, the stepper motor controlled by a microcontroller. And um, we also have a solid state relay, which controls the cartridge heater. So at, 200, at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, the uh, solid state really switches and it turns off and it fluctuates uh, to about uh, five degrees tolerance and it, until it just stays in about 350 degrees and it extrudes off this end. All right, this is a, essentially an electronic schematic of what's going on. Uh, as I mentioned before, the cartridge heater is connected to the, to the temperature controller as well as the, the thermocouple. And we have AC going in through a thermal block will distribute the energy necessary, the electricity necessary to power all the components. All right, we're able to extrude multiple pieces of, of, uh, of PLA plastic. This will be the first one and increasing the latest here. Now, at this point, we're, mess we're, we're um, working with 250 degrees and, uh, and so on. Until we get to 350, we're extruding a, a solid more consistent diameter filament. And uh, upon, upon more research, we found that we needed to, we needed to be cooled quick, more uh, quicker. And what we decided to do is create a plastic manifold that would attach to the fan, which would direct air directly to, and only to where the filament is being extruded, as opposed to a fan releasing air to the entire area, which would, event, which would also cool the actual cartridge heater and the aluminum sleeve. Uh, so, well, upon re uh, reaching the, the desired diameter for 3D printing, we're going to create this uh, test specimen here, which we would then be able to collect uh, different mechanical properties using machinery here in, the, in, um, in this facility. So this is our proposed schematic of how all of our components would be integrated together. Plastic waste that can be um, acquired will be placed into the recycler. This creates a micro enterprise for a community that they can create um, plastic goods or simply just uh, recycle plastic pellets that can be sold for plastic manufacturing. Uh, one application of the recycler that we um, investigated was printing a hydro turbine made with uh, recycled plastic. 
the rain that is caught from the gutter and is filtered can also be connected into some kind of interconnected way that can further harness the energy from the water. And we also uh, investigated the solar components of energy harnessing. The waste that's produced from the household can be treated in two ways. Gray water into our constructed wetlands, the black water into the biodigester, along with any other multiple um, organic waste, creating a closed loop cycle of fertilizer food production and energy recovery. Now for the economic analysis, this is an estimated one. Uh, this will be to implement the whole uh, project into a village of 10 houses. Uh, this is the total, it will be around $19,000. Uh, the most uh, expensive of the components will be the solar power. Um, this is mostly because of the batteries and we're, we're actually trying to um, not use the batteries um, because they're not sustainable uh, friendly, let's say. Um, actually, some of the funding options for this, the community will, will get this funding from government grants, from bilateral trust funds, uh, from NGOs, environmental conservation agencies, community-based organizations, food and health foundations. So the idea is since the, it, the project encompasses so many options, there can be funding from a lot of sources that would fund a project such as this for any community to want to become sustainable, uh, sustainably developed. And like Nati was saying, the battery issue is a very big concern, therefore, therefore uh, for further research, we could use uh, some water ener no, some energy storage, uh, something like a small scale compressor energy storage, or a pump uh, hydro storage for this, in order not to use the batteries. That will decrease the, the cost, and it will also be more environmentally friendly. So in conclusion, recapping our presentation, we can treat our waste Using biological processes that do not put greater strain on the environment, we must start views, viewing our waste as resources from which we can uh, recover energy and valuable recycled material. We can fulfill our energy requirements from renewables if we focus on a decentralized energy approach that we believe by integrating all of these different components, we can attain sustainable development. Thank you very much. All right. Well, look at the time. You were over about two and a half minutes. So you but make, make but do you think day. that since like it's like interdisciplinary, those two and a half minutes are like a big deal since we have so much to talk about? Yeah, well, probably not a big deal, but okay. uh, we'll you know, try. Yeah, try and okay. see if you can shave a bit off. Okay. Well, all well. right. So that's on the time matter. Um, bring up the hydro energy system slide again for me. as way at the start. That one or no, the next the, one? Go, for, go forward. This one? No, forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, go, I guess those uh, shaded colors are pressures, are they? The shaded colors? Yeah. No, the, to the, the right stresses. side. No, yes. <coughs> Is that stresses? Those are one piece of stresses. Okay. All right. Is there any way that you could uh, uh, bold those or make them a little clearer? They're not very visible from back here. Okay. Yeah, so we can see the what's maximum. up with the guidance, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's see what the okay. Or at least the maximum in and the, you know, something like that so we can see the range. Right. Okay. All right. So that, that would provide some improvement in clarity. All right, let me, uh, let me look at the hydro range system slide now. Okay. Uh, the same comment. There is a little bit of a clutter there. Uh, I don't know, what are those blue marks over top of the houses? Okay, so the, the little blue ones are the house tanks. Then the next okay. scale is the small community tank. The next scale is large community tank. Then the village tank. Okay. And finally a water well. Well, bold your legend. Got it. Okay. All right. And um, you systematically use SI units. And uh, you're speaking to an American audience here. I know from a scholarly perspective, uh, it's, it's a great thing to talk in SI units. It's the international units. but. You know Americans are pretty, uh, what did I say? So uh, address the American audience by providing okay. as much as you can, okay. as much as you can, uh, a comparable U.S. units in parentheses, perhaps, 
next year. Yeah, we can, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, okay. yeah, we try to do it with SI since. No, I understand. I, mean, I, I understand, but do understand. Yeah, that. I do understand. Uh, okay, uh, you brought in some external information, which I presume came from your lit review and your research and all of that. Uh, and those were incorporated in some of your slides. Is that um, is it possible that you could include those sources in those slides in terms of citation or URL or something like that? Otherwise, it's bordering on plagiarism. Yeah, for the for the information. Yes, for the information. So on, okay, on those slides. Is, on those is slides. it okay if we source the things on the actual slides and, and not on a reference page separately, right? Well, we're not seeing the reference page exactly. here. Exactly. So. Uh, for those slides that have those proprietary information that you got from your lit review, uh, just have a citation at the bottom. Mm -hmm. The URL will be just fine. Okay. Um, the, um, now, bring up the recycler slide for me, please. Yeah, uh, you just did it back. Back one. There we go. Uh, could you make that a little clearer? I don't know if it's a color scheme or font size or whatever. You have to but make the letter look yeah. You got it? Yes. And uh, eventually there, there will be a video there. Yeah, for next week we promise a, a short video. Okay, beautiful. Well, well then you remember you're over time, so yeah. the video. It will be on. a 30 second video. Okay. <laughs> we'll cut off some parts of this thing. All right, uh, go to the economic analysis slide. question on this one is that is a real deal for a community though those costs. Real deal for 10 whole communities. Okay, got it. Um, have you done any kind of a prototype uh, to show some of your expenses for the prototype so that you could predict yeah, and validate yeah, yeah. some of your work? Mm -hmm. uh, you may want to bring that in somewhere. Okay. So we have several different prototypes so we can, do, do you want us to like the economic analysis? Just say, from the what I would suggest, one? what I would suggest is that you have an overall cost like you have there in the real deal for the prototype. So okay. you can see it's scaled up or Okay, down. so we can compare it. Exactly. Okay, sounds good. And, and then in that regard, you may well also want to provide a timeline and, and show how that timeline and division of labor amongst you all uh, it's correlated to to uh, to that effort. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, now I know all of this has to do with uh, with uh, global learning and global learning initiatives, and and there are components on the evaluation form. Have you all seen that yeah. rubric that you would be evaluated on? Yes. So please try and make sure you. You address all of those things because each of those line items are going to get numbers to rate you. So you want to make sure you address them all. Otherwise, you're going to get a zero for those line items. And global initiatives is one uh, one large component. In fact, three line items. So make sure you address that. And I know all of this deals with uh, global learning initiatives. But see if you can capsulize that into a focus statement or so three focus statements right. exactly. Got it. So because once you do that then no one will have to think or imagine what numbers should go in those line mm -hmm. items. You will automatically score. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So that's a strategic, strategic thing that's because your, all of your work speaks to that. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so the only other thing is to uh, watch your time because uh, the IAB folks are going to be looking at the clock like I am. And um, that, that could impact your score, and I have no control over that. That's you. Okay. All right. That's it. Uh, did you find those constructive? That's, yes. that's, that's it. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Very helpful. All right.